Welcome to Work Life by Design. I'm your host, Mel Marsden. In a time when we can work from anywhere, why is it that we actually need to go to work to work? You're about to hear how organisations have optimised their business by shifting employee and business mindsets from slow, stagnant operations to agile and flexible environments, established premium levels of employee experience and realised substantial profits. You'll be inspired by stories of transformation, exploring everything from organisational psychology to brand and identifying opportunities that exist in your workplace environment to inspire your human potential. As a passionate entrepreneur with a desire to create places where both people and business thrive, my sole focus is to inspire you to find your place at work and in life so you can live a life by design. Hello and welcome to episode eight of Work Life by Design. In this episode, we're going to be talking about what work might look like beyond 2020 and how our workplaces are going to continue to evolve to support us. We'll be discussing everything from what our buildings look like and the evolution that they're going to go through, as well as how our workplace environments themselves may actually transition. What we're going to be seeing as we continue back into our workplaces is that we're really just looking at an acceleration of the future of work, how technology is going to continue to enable us and support us to help keep us productive, but also safe. We'll be looking at how that technology is going to continue to evolve and what some of those changes might be in our buildings as well as in our workplaces. We'll be looking at how well-being is going to become a much more strong focus for us as individuals within our workplaces and how organisations can begin to change that thinking to support mindfulness, stress and well-being of their employees through their whole organisation. We'll talk about workplace strategy and how that becomes an important foundation for us to start to map our future and really look at what the purpose of our workplaces are going forward. I'll share with you some tools and resources in the show notes that will help you prompt you through that journey. And I'll also share with you a beautiful quote that I found from Unwork, where they talk about the physical environment being a cultural garden to build community. We'll also explore the concept of binary thinking and how we continue to shift from a either or scenario to something of a more of an and, and how that hybrid thinking can actually translate into our culture and to our physical environments. I'm also going to leave you with a last little challenge around how the hot desk is dead and what my thoughts are on that. So I hope you do love this episode. Let's jump in. Today, we're going to be talking about workplace trends beyond 2020. So last week, we were talking about some of the short-term changes that we need to be making in our workplace environments to help us all move back into the workplace after we've all gone home and how some of those have been more immediate changes that we've needed to make around both the physical environment but but also the behavioural changes that we need to be making through that period of time. Today what we're going to be looking at is how we need to start planning for some of these more major changes that we're going to be need to looking at as we move into the future. While we can't actually predict the long-term impact of what this pandemic is going to have on our workplace environments, all the signs that we're seeing at the moment are leading towards an acceleration of what we're calling the future workplace. So a lot of that comes around technology. So some of the things that we're going to see change are going to be coming at a significant investment though for us as organisations, but also from uh, what we're going to be expecting from our buildings as we're looking for new lease terms. So around those things, we're going to be looking at what we call creating healthy buildings. And that's going to cover a range of things from starting from biometric hardware installations. So things that are going to be sensor uh, operated. So whether that's access to buildings through finger scanning or both in thermal. So taking temperature checks as people are entering the building to see that they're um, healthy and before they're accessing the building. We're going to be seeing things like gesture responsive hardware. So you may have seen this even in your own home, uh, the soap dispenser, the dead or soap dispenser, you wave your hand underneath and the soap is dispensed. 
those sorts of things are going to start to come into the workplace, whether that's through center activated tapware, access to doors, um, and even, um, you know, recognizing us as we gesture towards the lift. So other things that are going to have to have a look at is building management systems. So we've got a lot of ventilation issues in our buildings at the moment. There's a quite common is our recirculated air. So we're going to need to start looking at how we can be bringing more fresh air into our buildings, bringing more of that outdoor air coming in. The other big thing that I think we're going to start to see is a return to a bit of the old way, so openable windows so that we can get that fresh air coming in from outside. Now a lot of our buildings over time have moved away from these things to being more fixed and then having our air conditioning system circulating our air. But what we're going to be doing is undoing a lot of that so that we can actually bring all of that in. And a great place to start if you're looking for more information on this is the well building standards. So there's a, a series of standards that have been created under the well building. Um, they cover everything from air to water, nourishment, light, fitness, comfort and mind. And they work on a rating system. And those new buildings that are being created, if by choice you want to look at that, that's something that you can then create your workplace around. A lot of the other things that we're going to start to see are around material choice. So any microbial whether it's powder coating, it's built into our floors, into our fabrics, any of those sorts of things that we can start to attract germs, we can start to repel that using these antimicrobial systems. The other thing that I think we're going to have is easy to clean materials and fabrics coming in. So a lot of the information that we've already been using in the design of our healthcare systems, bringing a lot of those products into our general workplace environment so that they're easy to clean, they're easier to manage, and they're much more sustainable over the long term from a virus and germ management system. Smart technology, I think, is going to be one of the biggest ones, and it's really going to come down to the automation. So anything that we can have uh, from a contactless perspective, so no touch. So that's going to cover everything from our lighting to our sensors. So um, a lot of our toilets and tapware and things are already operating in this way because we have sensor tapware, we've got sensor urinals, sensored toilets that auto flush, anything like that that we can automate so that we're having to have contactless connection with that, that's going to start to come through. Even things down to doors and elevators. So as we're approaching doors, having more doors that are going to be automated so that we are operating uh, without having to physically operate a handle, they're the sorts of things that we think we're going to start to see coming into the future workplace environment. I mentioned before about heat sensing and biometrics, but the other thing I think that's going to be a big part of this is going to be around sensor mapping and um, occupational sensors. So we're already starting to see these things to pop up in terms of our more progressive buildings. There is a sensory uh, system that can be installed into buildings to help monitor traffic flow and movement, utilisation, and also then we can pick up heat patterns so that we can understand what uh, parts of our buildings are more activated than others. So those sorts of things I think will become more mainstream. At the moment, they're an optional luxury item, but I think that's going to start to become something that's much more uh, mainstream for us. Voice sensors is something else that we can start to think about in terms of how how we can be voice activating. You think about what's happening with Alexa and Siri, how can those sorts of items be incorporated into our workplace environment so that we again are not having to touch things but we can interact with them in different ways. One of the other things that has been a luxury item and uh, has been more appropriated with activity-based work environments or agile-based work environments is workplace management software. So software that helps you plan and track your workforce in terms of desk allocation and seat bookings and meeting room bookings. So anything that we can do from our own individual devices rather than having to engage with a public device. So in some organisations you might see an iPad or some other sort of screen device at a meeting room. That's actually requiring me to physically interact with that pad as opposed to being able to then activate that from my iPhone because or my smartphone because that phone belongs to me and therefore it only has my, you know, I'm only interacting with that. So I'm not having to interact with another device that someone else may have interacted with and potentially have that transfer of, of germs happening there. So the other great thing about these workplace management softwares is that we can start to track capacity. We can start to identify how many people are using um, the building, the particular spaces, which spaces are being used more than others, and we can start to manage and have a much smarter understanding of how our buildings are being used. We can monitor employee movement and we can then use that for virus purposes if we ever require to, but it can also use it to help apply our physical distancing rules. So using AI and analytics, 
This can actually start to help us support our seating allocations, manage split shifts, um, staggered starts and, and weekly rotations. So these type of software is going to be something that we're going to be seeing implemented in many more of our buildings to help us manage that transition. The other big thing that I think we need to be thinking about is our wellness strategies. And for many organisations, a wellness strategy can sometimes be a fruit box and it's a little bit more than that. So it's really thinking about how we move people through our buildings. You know, do we have internal staircases? How do we connect people? But how do we then transition people through so that they're physically well as well? But when we talk about wellness, it's not just about the physical wellness. It's around mental and emotional wellness as much as it is physical wellness. And again, when we talked about the well building standard, they've actually got three criteria in there that start to talk to how we are actually supporting our people within our workplaces to help them be well. And that's around nourishment. We want to be ensuring that they're being nourished within their work environments, fitness and mind. So those three categories are actually falling into a well-building standard now as well. And when they talk about nourishment, it's around the provision of food options and having the ability to choose healthy, good food options and where those food options are being sourced from and you know whether they're organic or not. So actually having an understanding of where our food is coming from and then having fitness. So fitness is about having the interior circulation supporting fitness. So again, are we providing an opportunity for people to move around and to walk through the space? Are we giving them option to use stairs over lifts? Having options to use different spaces so that we're actually physically encouraging our wellness. But it also goes as far as looking at what are the active spaces that we're supporting our organisations with, both internally and externally to the space. So have I got access to go and do physical activity at lunchtime? Or is there a gym in the building that I can then go and, and do a workout? So it's about thinking about how our buildings are actually then supporting our wellness as well. And that's not all going to be on the employer, but the employer is going to be looking for those spaces when they're sourcing their buildings and making their lease decision. So that's just going to come down to what our landlords are offering and how we're then supporting our people through the types of buildings that we're creating. Having the equipment on site to be able to do all of that stuff. And then we start to think about the mind. How are we going to be supporting well people uh, through mindful activities? And that's coming down to everything from programs. So are we providing well-being programs for our people? And are we creating our spaces to be beautiful. Now, I know that interior design can sometimes be considered that all we do is create pretty and beautiful spaces, but that is a very important element because when we feel like we're in a beautiful space, we have a really positive reaction. And there is some really fantastic science that sits behind this and supports that, that we, we actually like to be in beautiful spaces. The other layer to that is around biophilia, so the actual utilisation of plants in our environments, our connection back to nature, that all has a very positive impact on our mind as well. But then it's about thinking about what can we be doing as an organisation around um, our different policies, encouraging healthy sleep, how we're encouraging people to consider how they're travelling, and then also how are we then supporting their families and their stress and potential addiction and making sure that we've got education around that as well. How we are actively supporting our people so that they can begin to recover because we're all actually recovering. It's not just the economy that's recovering, our organisations are recovering, our people are going to be recovering and how are we supporting one another through that and what are we doing as an organisation to enable that and to put these programs in place to, to provide that support. There's a lot of information there, so where do we start? What do we actually need to do to make this happen? Well, I think we all need to start with a workplace strategy. You need to actually gather all of the data to know where you are right now so that you can actually start to plan where you're going. You know, where we want to be, how do we want to get there? So you need to understand, you know, what is the actual purpose of our workplace? Why don't we all just continue to work from home? If I'm going to go into the workplace, what am I actually going there for? What do I need to do when I'm there? So these are all the questions that we need to be asking and thinking about so that we can start to build a, a strategy around what our workplace environment is going to look like into the future. You know, a lot of the stuff we've just spoken about has all been technology and it's all material change, it's all of those things, but what are the physical changes that we need to be making to our workplace environments from a strategic perspective to help us move forward?
Now, I've read this really fantastic quote over the weekend and I'll share this article in our Facebook group as well and it's from Unwork. They said in this article, and it just really resonated with me, the physical office is a garden for cultivating relationships which bloom over how was your weekends, quick coffee catch-ups and shared workplace experiences. I think that just really sums up exactly what our workplaces are there for. They're there to create relationships, to help foster those connections, to enable us to bump into people and to create a conversation and to really build our sense of community together. So how can we create an environment that's going to do that? And they also went on to talk about less binary thinking in terms of is it work or is it home? Is it travel or is it fixed? Is it productive or is it useless? And rather than less talking about either or, let's talk about and. It's work and home. It's travel and it's fixed. You know, we need to be thinking about how we can create this hybrid culture and this hybrid space around how we actually use our workplace environments to utilize what we have and the opportunities we can when we're at home. But then also, what are we actually going to be using our workplace environments for and how is that going to be supporting us individually, but also as an organization in the, to the future? So our organisations often have many strategies for various different things, but very rarely have I seen an organisation that has a workplace strategy. And it's really important if we're going to be understanding how we're going to be accommodating our people and the benefit that our workplaces are going to be bringing to our organisations into the future. Our workplace environments should be considered as an asset. Often they sit on the liability line in the P&L, but they are actually an asset. These are a space that can help us generate productivity, which then helps create profit, and therefore we can actually then do better and we can be better in the world. And so we should be reframing our thinking around what our workplaces are there for and taking them from being an expense to actually an asset that can help us create better outcomes and bring our people together so that they can work more collaboratively and collectively. Our workplaces going into the future need to be able to be reconfigured so that we can create connection and we can build socialization into our workplaces. And when we talk about socialization, that socialization isn't around just general chit chat. It's a professional socialization. These are the things that build those relationships. And when we have those relationships, it's far easier for us to work together because we have built an emotional connection with each other and we can support one another to achieve the outcomes that we need to as an organization. Our design needs to be adaptable. We need to be able to reconfigure things easily. We need to be able to change things around. It really needs to be so much more impermanent. We need to be able to make sure that we can expand and we can contract to support the various changing needs of the organisation. And that's where we, our workplaces need to think about that. The other big one that I'm starting to see being reconsidered, and we've been working with some clients for this over quite a number of years, and it's really taken its stride now given the current situation, is having a hub and spoke model. So having a centralised office location in the city and fringe area, but then having various satellite offices so that people don't have to travel very far every day. It's the opportunity to go and work in another environment where there's people having that mental connection with other people for socialisation and feeling like we've got our own ability to connect with others, but we're not having to go all of that way, you know, travelling an half an hour to an hour for some people to access those workplace environments environments but we're getting that collegiate nature much closer to home. That's why we've also seen such a rise in co-working spaces because even though I might be an individual flying solo and you know living my best life as an entrepreneur I'm actually being able to access a space where there are other people there doing similar activities and I can build a relationship with somebody else and have that, that physical connection so that I'm not feeling isolated and sitting back in, you know, in my home on my own. It's about giving people choice, having the empowerment that we can then decide where and how we're going to best work and then what our organisations can do to support that. Obviously, there are objectives that each of our organisations need to achieve, but what can we do to put some structure in place that enables people to you know, both satisfy their own personal desires, but also then those desires of the organisation. And, you know, I think when we can mesh those two things together, we're going to have a far better outcome for what we're able to achieve going into the future. The other thing that I've heard lately is the hot desk is dead. Now, I really want to challenge this thinking because how is it going to be feasible for organisations to provide a desk for every employee when there's potential that I might only be coming into the office two to three days a week? 
that is a lot of redundant space that we are having to create for people. The other thing is when I come into an office, am I going to want to sit at a desk? Is that why I'm coming into the office is to sit at a desk? And for some people it may well be because of their home situation. They may have poor internet connection. They might have young children at home. There may be, you know, an underlying reason why they want to physically come and sit into the workplace. But for others, it's going to be for a very different reason. You know, if I'm coming into the office, I'm going to be coming in here to connect with my colleagues. I want to be meeting with them. I want to be brainstorming with them. I want to be collaborating with them. Now, that's not something I'm going to be doing sitting at a desk. I'm probably going to be doing that in a meeting space or with a whiteboard or in a lounge area or if the structure of that space is going to be very, very different to what a workstation is providing me. So how can I actually create a space that's going to support these different activities that I'm going to want to do when I come into a workplace? So I really just want to really challenge that thinking and let us be a bit more progressive in terms of, well, what is it that our organisations are going to need going forward and how are we going to support the people that are going to be working in them and the activities and tasks that they're going to need to be doing. So I realise that we're actually left with probably far more questions than we have answers, but what we want to start doing is sitting down and beginning to answer those questions and then capturing those answers and planning out our future. And that's why it's really important that we need to start considering what our workplace strategy is going to be because when we've got that, we know where we're going and we know what we're working towards. You know, I've heard many organisations are starting to relinquish leases and things and perhaps your organisation isn't quite at that point yet. You know, you might have two, three years to run on your lease at the moment so you've actually got quite an extensive amount of time that you can start to think about and you can begin to plan you know what your next move is going to be and how you can make the best opportunity from that transition at the end of your expiring lease but there's also many things that you can do in a short-term solution to support your team and your organization to really enable them to work the best that they possibly can throughout this period of time. If you need some help in planning for this, we've put together a toolkit which you'll find under on our homepage. It's the resources toolkit to help you re-enter the workforce um, post-COVID. So that's there. But the other really exciting thing that we're working on at the moment is our next program. And that program is aimed at supporting us in actually transitioning back into the workplace and creating our optimal employee experience. So our employee experiences need to be created to really attract and retain our best talent. So keep an eye out for the upcoming program. It's called Inspire Your Human Potential at Work. And it's designed to help support um, individuals who are within these workplace environments to give you guys the tools and the understanding so that you can apply some of these workplace strategy principles and start to develop your own plans to move your organisations forward. I think we've got some fantastic and exciting opportunities to really transform how our workplaces function and what's happening within those. And we've got all of the tools and resources in front of us. We just need to understand how we can collate that data and then analyse it to create the best possible environment. So until next week, thank you very much for joining me, guys, and I'll see you then. Bye. Thank you for joining me for Work Life by Design. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd love you to rate, review or subscribe or all three in iTunes and share it with your friends so we can continue to build this community. I would love to hear from you. If you have any thoughts, questions or suggestions, you can connect with me on Instagram at Melma or send me an email at melissa at melissamarsden.com.au. I hope this episode has given you a few sparks of inspiration so you can design a work life you love.